Hello there. Can you guys hear me and see me? Great. Had to get my audio and my camera set up. But looks like we're in. Thank you again for joining us. Um, I put in the chat box our outline for today. Um, first, we're going to start off by defining rep or defining the reparations handbook or outlining the handbook just so you guys can know what to expect when you purchase the book. Um, also, we're going to define reparations and identify the United States moral commitment to providing reparations to their victims of gross human rights violations. Um, we're going to quickly go over the case for reparations and then how can we participate ourselves in reparations. So uh, feel free to ask any questions in the chat box. I'll be glancing at that every now and then. And let's go ahead and get started. So um, first of all, thank you very much for your interest and time in reparative justice. Just to introduce myself, um, I am Chrissy Jackson. I'm co-founder and former co-director co of the Truth Telling Project. Um, I am a former Bayard Rustin Scholar at the Fellowship of Reconciliation, a former grassroots organizer and fundraiser for different human rights organizations. And currently I am working as the founder, CEO, um, and financial advisor for um, Ampla Finance. So you'll see all of that um, in my bio information and let's get started. So, Reparations Handbook. This is the paperback. It's available on all platforms. It's 100 pages, and it was really important for me to make this handbook available and easy to read, like an easy, quick read, jam-packed with information, um, and it's pretty much your Reparations 101. So I set out writing this with the intention to create an educational tool that can be referenced when you yourself are making a case for reparations for Black people in the United States. So um, this is a go-to uh, go guide for you to kind of pin through and you know really be able to argue and advocate for reparations um, in, an, in a knowledgeable intellectual way. So, um, one thing I can say is when I start out on this journey of writing this book, I could not have anticipated the impact that it was going to have on me and just my overall view of the world, really just learning um, not only about African American history, but especially in the context of human rights and in the context of why African Americans, Black Americans deserve reparations and the impact that the lack of reparations has had, the ongoing impact that it continues to have on our nation as a whole. So um, I really, you know, would encourage you to check out the book and I'm hoping that it will have a similar impact on you as well. Um, but quite frankly, a culture of white supremacy is present in practically every single facet of American life. And even when I was writing this book, I was very conscious that, you know, the context in which I was writing and even the way that I was fact checking, the way that I was, um, you know, listing my, citing my sources and just in, just in the way I was telling the story, I was very conscious that, wow, even in the way that I'm writing, this is a colonized mind, right? Like what is, I, I felt my um, myself, my passion, you know, the research, the scholar in me writing it in one way and actively was comp competing with this other like part of my brain that was very conscious of how uh, this this uh, this um, information is going to be palatable to white people and how to make it palatable to white people and for a general context. And so, you know, I I really struggle to decide which parts of our history, as traumatic as it is, um, to include when writing this and making a case for reparations. And ultimately, I 
just went with what I personally and, uh, and professionally think is most important to argue our case for reparations, because oftentimes this history, as ugly as it is, can just be talked about and um, sold in a kind of way to make people feel things. And essentially we end up just perverting the traumas that our ancestors have been through and that we have gone through um, without being relevant to what our result, what the, the results that we want. And so um, anyway, I um, feel like enough information is relevant in the book to provide you plenty of context with arguing for reparations and to sort of give you avenues um, to go down further if anything in particular piques your interest. So chapter one begins by defining reparations. And we talk about the United States moral commitment to protecting human rights and to providing reparations to Black Americans, and not only to Black Americans, but to all its victims of gross human rights violations, as we have done in the past, except for with Black Americans. Um, chapter two is a summary of slavery's impact on building the nation's foundation of wealth and uh, its ongoing impact in the economy as a whole. Uh, chapter three talks about the culminating events that ultimately resulted in Jim, the Jim Crow era. And then we go in and talk about Jim Crow um, in depth in that and the long lasting impact that experiencing several decades of um, legalized discrimination, um, legalized separation of the races and and just the, the terrors that Black people uh, experienced during the Jim Crow era has left not only a long lasting impact on African Americans, but as an, on American culture as a whole. Um, chapter four, we kind of recap the largest migration in US, uh, excuse me, in world history. I think it's the second largest in all of history of mankind, which is the great migration when Black people left the South and went to the North and to the West by the millions, um, which really changed American culture and has also left an impact, a la long lasting impact on um, American culture as a whole and American politics, et cetera, and has really made a large contribution um, to who the country is in the context of who we are, um, how we identify as American and how the world identifies us as American. And let's see, in chapter six, we talk about, oh, excuse me, in chapter five, we talk about the several acts of genocide committed against African Americans, which were all, you know, we, we focus on the specific attempts of genocide, which um, were all just purely racist attempts, largely motivated by um, just ridding the United States of African Americans or just getting them out of the workforce um, by causing them, you know, bodily harm and, um, you know, sterilizing women, et cetera. Um, chapter six, we go into the um, current criminal justice system and we really analyze how the criminal justice system, how it operates today is a direct um, it's a direct lineage of the um, system that specifically targeted Black people and Black men to make a profit and how successful that was and how that just kind of grew and culminated into the system that we have today. And then chapter seven, we talk about, or we uh, kind of analyze the racial wealth gap and talk about how um, what causes that and uh, what we can do with that and what that looks like today. And then in chapter eight, we talk about what next. So chapter eight, it kind of serves as a part two of the book. So it's like, okay, we've discussed reparations. We've discussed the case for reparations. Um, so what can we do about it now? So um, I always like to kind of 
put in a disclaimer that while reading the book chapter one through seven, um, I really like to encourage you to read and learn about reparations um, and keep in mind that as, as traumatizing as this is, this is part of our history. And yes, it's personal. It's very personal. But it, when, when it comes to arguing for reparations, it's really important that we stay focused on what we want the goal to be. Um, because far too long have we been sidetracked or, you know, this issue can become such a huge issue that it can take us down many different avenues and we can slice it up and talk about um, semantics for decades and hundreds of years as we have, right? But it's really important that we stay focused on reparations for Black people when we're talking about reparations for Black people if we wanna be successful with um, achieving our goal. So with that said, let's go ahead and get into, um, today we're gonna, I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of a, a reparations 101, if you will. So right now we're gonna go ahead and start by defining reparations. Now, uh, first I want to just kind of talk about the uh, reparations definition as given by INCOBRA. So INCOBRA is the National Coalition of Blacks Reparations in America. They have been at the forefront of um, providing education and even helping to write legislation like HR 40 for, about reparations for reparations. And INCOBRA defines reparations as a process of repairing and restoring people who were injured by governments, corporations, institutions, and families because of their group identity. Now, um, as far as a general definition, I believe this is a great, this is not only a great definition, but also um, I think that it deserves priority versus if you're looking up Webster's Dictionary, et cetera because when it comes to repairing the damage caused by groups fundamental uh, on a, a excuse me when it comes to um, addressing someone's human rights being violated it should be up to the victims or the people whose rights have been violated to define what reparations is and i really want you guys to keep that in mind because um it's, it's gonna be a group effort to achieve reparations. It's gonna take people of all races. We're gonna be working with people of all races. Um, and it's really important that if you are in a space where a person of color, if a black person uh, who presents himself as black, who identifies as black, an African-American is not at the forefront of that conversation, they should be, and we should move for that to happen because it is inappropriate for um, the person who benefited off of violating someone's human rights to then go in and define what that is. And that is definitely gonna be a um, important thing to keep in mind as we are, um, as we advocate for reparations. Now, uh, the word reparations in itself is rooted in the word repair, which um, historically the word reparations is talking about repairing harms from a war, right? So um, if two countries are at war and what the winning country um, in their you know, in the battle, they lost men, they lose housing, they lose money. So the losing company, the losing country is obligated to pay the winning country for their losses. Now, um, it wasn't until about the 40, like 1940s, very recent that we start seeing reparations given to um, victims of human rights violations. And that was decided at the very first United Nations meeting in 1946. So um, during that um, conference, a document was co-authored and adopted by the United States. 
It's called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Highly recommend you read it. It's like a one page, it's a very beautiful document. Um, but in this document, uh, some quotes from there are, no one shall be sl held in slavery or servitude and slavery in the slave trade shall be prohibited in all forms. No one should be subjected to torture or cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment or punishment. No one should be subjected to, um, or excuse me, and everyone has a right to remedy any uh, remedies and repairs that violate their human rights. Now, a couple years later, the UN linked back up and decided, okay, we need to define what these remedies are so that there's a, um, a kind of like a go-to guide guideline on how to help repair and provide reparations for these victims of gross human rights violations. And so in that document, um, it's called the United Nations Basic Guidelines and Principles to a Right to Remedy and Reparation. Uh, it is outlined exactly like and suggested what reparations should include and how a country or a perpetrator of a, a gross human rights violation should go about um, repairing that harm. So um, I say that with an emphasis on the United States does not have any, you know, hard guidelines about not providing reparations. We've provided it several times in the past to several victims of gross human rights violations. Um, and including when we've committed gross human rights violations against our own citizens, which happens often, right? So, of course, we have uh, the, several treaties and several um, uh, agreements with Native Americans. And, you know, the United States has, have, has given thousands, millions of dollars to Native American um, communities, well-deserved, don't get me wrong, this is not a comparison, uh, well-deserved money, land back to the Native Americans when the United States um, rounded up all Japanese Americans and put them in concentration camps during World War II. Many years later, the United States recognized the harm that they that that caused. They recognized that you know that was a major human rights violation that had long-lasting effects on that community and provided them trusts and thousands of dollars each. I think it's about $24,000 per person who was in um, held in concentration camps and um, many other community kind of programming. And so it kind of leaves us to ask the question, okay, why has, has African-Americans not been deserving of, of reparations um, uh, you know, by Congress standards, right? What is this bias? Why is African Americans receiving reparations so controversial? And so um, in this book, we do talk about uh, many times where not only the United States has given reparations, just so you have that, you know, that you can pinpoint that when you're advocating for reparations, but we also go into the case for reparations, right? And so this is talking about the harms that the United States has caused, the gross human rights violations committed against African Americans, the contributions that African Americans have made to the United States, and also um, the impact that not giving reparations for this long of time, for this period of time, has. Um, has had and is continuing to have on the United States. So or, or on our culture, or excuse me, on our in our country as a whole, not just the United States as an entity, but on all of us. And um, so we first go into the Jim Crow era. And not only do we talk about some of the harms and traumas, but we also talk about um, the long lasting effect that Jim Crow experiencing Jim Crow or just this extreme um, uncertainty of violence and r racism, separation, that this has caused not only Black Americans, but all Americans, and even how um, it has 
been coded into our genetics to have uh, effects that are still being um, are being researched. And we talk about that research inside the book. Um, as far as contributions in chapter four, again, uh, we talk about the great, the great migration and how the, the contributions of the great migration had uh, those contributions, what they had on the um, culture as a whole, but then also the extreme um, acts of genocide that happened during that time. Um, we talk about, you know, slavery in the United States, the continued slavery, evolved slavery, if you will, and the US criminal justice system and stunted growth, which has, um, which is an effect of the United States, or the lack of education, the lack of health care, the lack of um, equal access to opportunity in, in Black America. So um, let's go ahead and talk about what next. And excuse me if I my eyes are darting all over the place. I'm actually going to read some of this. And it is a little bit different not talking to you guys or seeing any of you guys, but bear with me. So um, I'm going to go ahead and just read a little bit from the... Uh, excuse me, from chapter eight, when we talk about a path forward. So though the quality of life has undoubtedly approved, improved for Black people over time, Black Americans over time, a long list of racial inequities continue to grow. And this list of injustices is increasing because there has never been an effective remedy and repair for enslaving Black people over 150 years ago. So the more time that's passing without a remedy, the more challenging it starts to become, not only for us, but for future generations to really identify the why the struggles that they're going, or being able to connect the dots between the struggles that they're going to today, that, go, that are, they are going through today, excuse me, um, how they are uh, rooted in the very institution that you know, we all wish to excel in. So yes, successful, successes of the civil rights movement have given Black Americans the opportunity to integrate into almost every part of society and advances in technology provide access to unlimited information with the ability to network with people of all races all over the country. And because of this, the illusion of mobility is often confused with equality. But the fact is, there's hardly a path that any Black American can take where we're not going to encounter racial discrimination. So even though many African Americans do not identify with the term victim, that does not make you exempt from experiencing the lingering consequences of unrepaired structural damage. And since effective action was not taken immediately after slavery to promote nationwide racial healing and provide former slaves with land and the ability to integrate into society, the United States was able to successfully sustain an, an economy and society in favor of people with white skin. So there were many opportunities post abolition and before the Jim Crow era for Congress to set a nationwide precedent for racial equality. And we do talk about this in the book as well um, in earlier chapters, but instead of promoting this nationwide equality, they chose to reinforce institutionalized white supremacy. And as a result, race-based inequities that persist today are not just exclusive to the descendants of slaves, they are they affect all black people in the United States. And, and that goes for every single class level. And likewise, white America is, or all white Americans, whether you know their ancestors were in the United States at the time of slavery or not, they all are able to benefit from a system of white privilege. Um, so um, with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about, uh, I do assume, you know, being that this is the AME church, that um, we do have a um, predominantly Black audience. So in the context of the church and rethinking the church and us, how us as Black people can participate in reparations, um, I'm going to go ahead and talk about some ways that we can um, rethink 
about our communities and about our futures in the context of reparations. Now, again, um, because so much time has passed without, without you know, um, reparations being given, right? Without like a, uh, a specific initiative to help heal the country racially, because that has not happened, um, we all kind of have, ex we all kind of have this colonized mind. We all are experiencing the effects of um, what it's like to be colonized and then to have to operate in the um, in the system of your of your colonizers, essentially. So um, let's see here. So with that said, I would like us to, you know, when we're thinking about reparations, it's, it's pretty crucial for us as Black people to think about, okay, um, how in what ways has uh, the colonization of the United States, in what ways has that affected our ancestors in the past, and in what ways is that continuing to affect us today, right? And so... Um, that's why it's going to be important that in when we're talking about reparations, when we're advocating for reparations, that we're making sure to be the advocates for ourselves and making sure that we are make that these spaces are always black led. Um, let's see. So in the um, the United Nations document for. Uh, the right to remedy and reparation for gross human rights violations. Reparations is defined in five different ways. And so that's restitution, compensation and rehabilitation, satisfaction and guarantees of non-repeat. So for rest restitution, um, reparations is, it, people are, victims of gross human rights violations are entitled to reparations through land, through their rights being restored and through uh, their identity being restored. So how can we participate in that as black people participate in our own repairing our own communities? Well, um, one, one thing is uh, we need to talk about all of the people who are incarcerated because they have been victimized by a racist criminal justice system and either are in jail without a trial um, they're in jail for um, a, 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 um, excuse me, misdemeanors or felonies, just any kind of criminal act, criminal act, uh, alleged criminal act that um, got blown out into the next category, right? Misdemeanors getting, getting um, charged as felonies, et cetera. So how can we how can we as our communities, how can we in our own profession help provide people who are, who may be in jail, who may have been in jail without a trial, who may have, you know, um, been, been wrongly incarcerated, how can we provide our services in order to help people get a fair trial, right? Um, Color of Change, the organization Color of Change has a really great initiative that they do, I believe it's a couple times a year, where they bail out Black mothers, bail out Black fathers. Um, yes, we can contribute to that with our finances. That's great, very needed. But in what other ways can we use our, our skills, right? So um, people working in the legal industries. As a church, what ways can we help facilitate the restoration of rights and re-entry back into um, into society for those who are formerly incarcerated. And so these are, this is a huge, huge, um, incarceration has a huge effect on the Black community over time and it continues to still incarcerate. And I know it's very easy for people to have this like, oh, um, you know, I'm Black, I've never been in jail, but if, if that's you, then you are in the minority. Right, and it's very important for 
us to remember that, you know, just because you might be a black person of a, a certain class level, you are in the minority. And if, and if we're really going to find advancement for our community as a whole, then we need to be thinking as a collective. Um, also, um, in what ways can we as an individual have our, you know, participate in restoring our an ancestry, right? And so, um, learning about our ancestry, getting our DNA tested, and um, just learning where you came from. How can you participate in restoring the ch the customs of those that uh, of of your ancestors? Now, when it comes to compensation and rehabilitation, um, rehabilitation is defined as um, providing health care and, um, you know, mental health care and physical health care, et cetera, right? So in compensation, I would just encourage everyone to not shy away from um, talking about cash payments as a form of reparations. I think many times people go into advocating for reparations with the genuine intention of, you know, oh, we want to make sure that we make this palatable to white people. We want to make sure that we actually ha are successful. And then so we kind of like back down from um, advocating for cash reparations. But the fact is, um, Amer African Americans has contributed immensely to the um, the foundation of American wealth, both historically and continue to do so. And I would really encourage you not only to read the book and find out, but even if you're looking in the book and, and that gives you an avenue to say, hey, like, I wanna research more about this. I wanna research more about this. Really educate yourself on the, imp on the um, contributions of African-Americans to the United States economy so that you can really have that confidence when you're, um, when you're advocating for cash payments as a form of comp compensation for um, for reparations, right? And so, um, with that said, I also would encourage all of us to think about in our own jobs, with our own skills, um, with our own resources, how can we also help our communities, not just financially, but also how can we help heal and restore um, the integrity of our people with um, with our services. You know, how, how can you, I know that it's very important to be paid for your time and services. I know that a lot of us have families and a lot of us have, you know, school and jobs and all kind of things going on that you make it a little bit more, um, with that make us prioritize getting money over you know providing ser free services, but even if it's just one person a month that you're able to provide your services for for free or at a discounted price, that helping one if each if each one of us can help one person a month, one person in the black community a month, one um, black organization that's doing good, that's helping to provide reparations for their local community. If each one of us can do that, that's going to have an incredible impact on healing our nation as a whole and specifically the black community, right? And providing healing for our own communities. Um, and then when it comes to satisfaction and guarantees of non-repeat, um, one thing that we can do as a black community is really just make sure that that we're pro researching and pro not only providing education for ourselves, but providing education to our own immediate communities, even if it's just your kids, even if it's just your friends, your fellow church members on um, what has happened in your local community. Um, what's the history? Who are the people that work the ground um, where you are today, you know, who um, occupied that land. There are many, 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 maybe hundreds of thousands of slave burials, unidentified slave burials all around the United States. And, you know, there are organizations that are doing their part to try to identify these slave burials. 
and um, and uh, uh, memorialize them, but they need money. <laughs> so, you know, if you want to look that up for yourself to help um, contribute, or you can do the research yourself and find out the history of the land that you're on and think about, okay, well, how can we, how can we memorialize um, the, the African American contributors of this country, right? We see statues in every single city of, um, you know, our white heroes, but, you know, how can we take it upon ourselves to honor, publicly honor um, the African Americans that contributed to American society? Now, really, that is all that I'm going to discuss when it comes to Black people participating in reparations. There's more in the book and there's many, much, much more that can spark your imagination. Um, but personally, I do feel like um, we should be leading these, these conversations. You can read more about it again in reparations handbook about in what ways government, local communities um, and individuals of moral responsibility of, you know, um, people who are interested in repair and equal access to society, right? To, to a, an equal America. How can we um, participate in reparations? Excuse me, I am, got a little distracted. So there's plenty of information about um, you know, reparations in the book. But it is important that um, as we are leading these conversations, that it is that we're not taking on the whole responsibility, right? There are ways that we can participate in healing ourselves, being conscious of how we're colonized, um, helping to provide restitution in our own communities, um, comp advocating for compensation, um, providing our own services for rehabilitation and then memorializing our ancestors and those that came before us. But it is also important that, that um, we do not take on the full responsibility because white people are the ones that started this, not, you know, and I'm not even making this a ratio. I'm just talking about historical facts. Um, white people brought black people over to the United States to build this country and white people went uh, an extra step further to implement a, um, a rate, implement racism into, into American society, into American culture and, and keep it up and, and capitalize on it. And so they should be the ones doing the work, right? So um, with that said, is there any questions? Any questions out here? We do have about 15 more minutes. If you guys have any questions, I can go ahead and um, try to answer. If not, then I will just, again, put in the information. You can learn more and about the Reparations Handbook and where to purchase at reparationshandbook.com or you can type in the reparationshandbook.com. They both go to the same place. And yeah, let's see. We got one request in the queue. Let's see if we can figure out how to get this. See your request. Oh, I see, I see. All right, thank you everyone. You guys have a good evening and thanks for having me. Thanks for your interest in reparative justice and um, yes, and feel free to reach out to me as well. I'm gonna go ahead and put my email in. You can also reach out to me at let's see, the reparations handbook at gmail.com. If you want to discuss further, I have a wealth of sources, resources, organizations that I can help link you with um, if you're interested in learning more. All right, thanks again, guys. Have a good evening.